to Closing the Wealth Gap, a business case. Uh, I'm Rajiv Narayana. I am president and CEO of learning design and development company, AnswerSource. And today I'm honored to be joined by the amazing Angel Rich, an author, advocate, and expert on black history and financial literacy. Uh, two subjects that have come into sharp focus this month. We're also very excited to have uh, Dr. Marcia Dyson with us, a global business strategist and social activists to provide additional context and expertise on, on, on this uh, very important subject. Inequity has been a subject of conversation due to some harsh realities laid bare by the COVID-19 pandemic, the recent acknowledgement nationally of the Tulsa race massacre and the attention to the development of Black Wall Street and the upcoming Juneteenth holiday this weekend that we hope and expect to see become a national holiday. Uh, while these events and public interest have certainly helped build awareness on the subject of building racial equity, many organizations and institutions struggle with how to appropriately integrate such celebrations and learning opportunities into their internal dialogue. With employees, students, and society as a whole demanding more uh, from the institutions and organizations they learn and, from and work for, uh, there's an increasing emphasis on consistent social responsibility. And uh, you know, with that context, I would like to hand it over to Angel and Marcia uh, to discuss a little bit more about the history that we've come to see this month and uh, how it plays out against black wealth in the current context. Well, thank you for having me, Angel. And thank you for the great introduction. Uh, what is so important is about Juneteenth, it's not about the celebratory moment of it and remembering the fact that almost uh, decades ago that Blacks who were enslaved found out that they were free. It's about commemorating the idea that Blacks were wealthy during the time period when many think would think that Blacks were sharecroppers or they were illiterate or they were not capable of masonry or building their own banks or educating their own children and creating communities where they could flourish without like third world so-called countries, the help of outside help. And so we're commemorating the idea of black excellence when that was not even an ideal and surely not nationally expressed. And throughout the subsequent decades following uh, to 1921, uh, the massacre in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it's also remembering those other cities that at the same time during the early 1900s were flourishing because of segregation. And so we have to remember the celebration is not only about the being the note of freedom, it was about the economic freedom that existed in these particular cities and townships for and black for and by black people. Mm. That was so well said, Marcia. And I just, I felt a hundred years of history as you were talking. As you were talking, I thought of my great grandparents who are original um, uh, people involved in DC, Black Wall Street, um, coming up from Lancaster, South Carolina, and then becoming some of the first black homeowners in the country um, in the 1940s. And then all the way to uh, present day, where just two weeks ago, I was fortunate to be invited out by another uh, mentee of yours, Angela Rye, um, and Tulsa um, for her special. And I had the opportunity while I was there to walk the streets of Greenwood, um, this 40 block radius that was founded by J.B. Stratford and O.W. Gurley, where they decided to only uh, provide these properties to black people. And then I came across the Cotton Club, but only the Cotton Club wasn't actually there. It was just a plaque on the ground. And it was next to something else that was not there. And that is the Beach Hotel, which was the top black hotel in the country, founded by J.B. Stratford. But what I could see diagonally across from it was Mount Vernon AME Church, the mm -hmm. only remaining building out of the Tulsa fire. And then when I looked up, I was staring at the belly of a freeway where as I stood in the heart of black wealth, the, the, the sort of nucleus of our experience, they have shredded it down to an overpass and ran a freeway through it. And I literally sat there for about 30 minutes 
just thinking of how much history was lost and buried at that very site. That's interesting, Angel, which will kind of bring us fast forward because we are on an intersection and on this highway of rebuilding Black communities, especially with some of the programs that you initiated on so many fronts and the information that you give through your financial literacy. Because when you talked about the inner inter uh, section of the highways, having these bypasses, literally, I like the word bypasses because the financial growth and um, for Black America has been bypassed, even though we have the highest disproportional uh, disposable income than we ever had. I remember working with Jesse Jackson as the chief of staff for his International Trade Bureau. Jesse Jackson always liked to talk about the disposable incomes of African Americans. We had the the wealth of some nations, you know, tiny nations throughout the world, but it seems as if the problem. Is, is that we have not been able to recoup the mass consistency of the building of black businesses and the infrastructures and the community in mass that we had the pleasure of seeing in the celebration of Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the old Chicago today so it's problematic i was thinking about my growing up in the 70s as a young adult taking over south shore community on the south side of chicago where a lot of young individuals like myself in their early 20s we bought up properties that was evacuated by the jewish community as they migrated away from the blacks who were migrating within the city from you know places that Two highways destroyed the black economic development. And we first started with not only buying buildings, which is still in my possession on the south side of Chicago, not far where President Obama is building his cultural library. So this building was bought in 1977. And I'm saying as soon as Obama throws down that first brick, that property exponentially that was bought for $25,000 in 1977 uh, would be almost a million dollars because of its largeness as well as being close to the lake. But we had a bank. We were responsible for gathering our pennies, our dollars to uh, establish the South Shore Bank. We had our own school. The churches were there. So Miss Angel, what I would like to pose to you, which is sort of an inside look at our situation, how do you think we went from 1921 with a greater, dis greater disposable wealth within our black community and the improbability to, uh, the impossibility to seem to build as we did in the past. What are those underlying factors that have made this such a critical and crucial uh, subject that we need to entertain while we're celebrating Juneteenth? You know, I honestly think it boils down to trust on both ends. You know, um, Freeman's Bank comes to mind when I think of this. First, not only do you have Black Wall Street where they literally just sort of burnt down um, our homes and our wealth, you also have moments like Freeman's Bank coming out of the Reconstruction era where our money was put into these financial institutions, um, but it almost kind of just created a pooled robbery, if you will. It kind of just made it easier um, for them to take the money. And without having this uh, knowledge history of incidents like Freedman's Bank and Black Wall Street, it leaves you sort of befuddled as to why Black people do not trust the financial services community, as well as even work with each other. And so when you look at that, I remember in conducting the African-American Financial Experience Study, we ask, do you feel as though the, uh, that corporate America has effectively engaged the Black community? And 78% of people said no, 78%. So if you're not taking the time to actually understand the community that you are trying to market and advertise to, then of course you're not developing that layer of trust that is needed for them to actually act on your products. Then you have amongst each other, from the very beginning, we was taught to distrust each other. From the very beginning, before they even put us on the boats, 
they would divide us up by various different languages and make sure that we did not speak the same language as we were positioned on the boat together so that we were not strategizing once we got off the boat as to what we would do. So from the very beginning of us being brought to this country, we've been taught to be um, at odds with each other. And the more that we can sort of uh, release those sort of different levels of distrust and just give each other a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt, as well as do proper business with each other, the more that we will be able to um, build on that faction. There also has to be a lessening of tokenism as well, where when you are the first one to enter the door, you don't shut the door behind you. You know, um, I have a friend named Stacy, and her and I were the first two black female uh, founders in DC with this whole startup movement. So her and I started doing this thing where if we got invited into a secret room, we would say that you had to invite the other one for us to show up or, you know, we was going to tell everybody. And so, <laughs> and that was one of the first ways that we were able to make sure that two of us was in the room as opposed to one of us. And then that started to break out from there. So we have to continue this underground railroad. Many people don't realize that the underground railroad never died. Um, it still exists to this day and we have to leverage it. We have to empower our conductors and we have to make them not afraid to speak out on things that are necessary to educate the community on, no matter how much it might ruffle somebody's feathers. Absolutely. And I like what you said. I, you know, since the play Hamilton is so familiar, I remember the character, you know, in the play, the real person, Ellen Burr, right? Who, who wanted to be in the room where it happened. And he, according to the play, you know, uh, man, uh, man, Manuel, Yep, Emmanuel. Yep. Right. That he wanted to diversify it because it showed us the dynamics of who was allowed in the room and who was not. And to see this black man not be in the room where it happens, it meant that he didn't have SS information, who the real power brokers were, and how he could communicate that particular thing since he was a politician to his constituency base or to inform the government that was in a developing stages. And so I would. Remember the quote by Dr. Martin Luther King, which is very seldom quoted, but for me, it's one of the favorite ones to sort of give us a bird's eye view what has happened when we talk about how can we go from Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Wall Street to Rosewood, Southside, Chicago, St. Louis, all these major black cities still that lie basically in waste. And he said that he believed that we could integrate ourselves out of power. And even though he was a minister, I think that he had the foresight to realize it wasn't out of our black power because we were still suffering through the civil rights movement. It was economic power because when we were segregated, we were happy, not forced to work with one another in black excellence, our beauty salons, our nail salons, the uh, bookstore, the restaurants, the, the bank, and the schools were all founded usually by, supported by, gave entrepreneurial opportunities for black people. But we got into the segregation, right? We thought, unfortunately, that everything white was right because now all of a sudden that little gate was open, that door into this room where we thought was happening. And now we find out it really wasn't happening, diluted our efforts that we were forced to be engaged in and somewhat, and I would say did, destroy our community and the mm -hmm. trust for one another because we were also then through usury banking, through redlining, not able to, or the small loans, right? Or the inability to have the financial literacy to supply for particular loans to, to have this kind of business that would let you grow from decade to decade was not sustainable, so therefore it's not deliverable in these communities. So my question to you, now that we understand that, and it wasn't in racism that Dr. King was saying that, he was just looking at, hey, the sheep that stay together, also the ones who sell the wool and hope that the sheep can grow more wool for prosperity. So Angel Rich, the woman who is considered to be the Black Steve Jobs, how can we, integrate ourselves 
back into this kind of wisdom? What are the sort of programs that you have for this financial literacy? And who are some of the partners who normally have now worked in the black community saying like, well, you know, he's right. We we're using you guys for credit and so on. I want to bring back this idea so that we who are black behind the eight ball can be on the pool table with the resources that we need to have that lucky shot. Well, Marcia, that was a whole sermon right there. I'm sorry. And if no, if I was to if I was to back into what you are discussing right there and taking apart what Martin Luther King or Dr. Martin Luther King is saying, we can be able to do this in power. And it will take also other communities. So, like you said, he wasn't necessarily talking about just black power. You have a few different factors here. You have the collective economics of the black community and us needing to trust each other, work together with each other and be advocates for each other. Then you also have what I call financial agriculture. And that is the mixing of the communities coming together. When you are dealing with agriculture, it is not proper to just plant string beans or carrots in the same plot in the same soil over and over again. You really should mix them up every about three months so that you are properly receiving the fruits of your labor from your soil and getting the best fruit possible. The same thing needs to happen when it comes to finances. We can't, yes, we need to have collective economics, but we also need to be able to mix and mingle with other cultures so that we are truly being able to get the best cultivation out of our soil. So then it goes to, okay, how do we do this? That then goes to my TED talk, be a Trojan horse. You know, again, where I was stating, you have to remove this tokenism. I have watched too many C-suite uh, uh, black professionals and VPs and things like that hold on to their title, don't push for things like history of the black dollar gems being integrated into their courses. Don't push for financial literacy. Don't push for the adoption of history of the black dollar going out to their HBCUs. They don't push for any of these things because they are too scared holding on to their titles. Where instead, they could probably actually be growing a future for themselves, creating other opportunities for other people throughout the organization, creating HBCU programs, creating entire different revenue uh, generating businesses for the company from them pushing for multicultural marketing and other initiatives. They could increase the productivity of the employees by being able to make things uh a, a, a more adaptive environment for all cultures. They can also increase home ownership by being able to adopt the financial literacy. So I believe that the power sits in the hands of these people that are inside of the corporations right now, but they are too scared to move forward because of a performance review where instead they could be bringing up these various different things and presenting these ideas and truly actually probably getting a promotion off of them. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to release this fear and I'm really happy to see that with, with Juneteenth becoming a holiday and the whole Black Lives Matter movement, it's almost provided an excuse for people to be able to openly discuss these things in corporate America. But as I have stated since the moment I graduated college, Yes, it is nice to know our history. Yes, it is nice as a philanthropic initiative. But more importantly, this is a business imperative. It makes absolutely no sense not to have us properly in those rooms. And like I was uh, mentioning to somebody, I had an investor say to me, imagine what the music industry would look like if there was no black people. Just imagine for a moment. That you is cannot what imagine. Right. You, can, you cannot even imagine it. So that is what's happening right now in the financial space as well as in the tech space. And if you look at who the top billionaires are in the world, they are finance people and tech people. So in order for us to close this wealth gap, we really have to come together on employment, education and entrepreneurship properly educating people on black history, like what we're doing with our gyms, as well as educating them on financial literacy. The entire thing has to come together so that we are able to fix this web that has been destroyed, well actually created and been destroyed and whatever mix you wanna say for the past 400 years. We have to almost take a pulse and build a new structure as to how the country should have been properly built. 
many people don't realize that they were able to build America as a result of the Industrial Revolution. Well, what paid for the Industrial Revolution? Cotton. America was able to supply cotton at the highest quality for free at the cheapest price. Free. And so um, basically by leveraging the labor of our ancestors, they were able to build up so such a large economy. Absolutely. And helping people to understand this, and I'll take a quote directly from you, Marcia, you can't say that we do not deserve our capital when we used to be collateral. Hello. So, yes. So taking yes. all of that into consideration, it becomes more and more necessary for people, especially uh, in, in marketing financial services and wanting to help their employees and want to help their communities to understand this history. Because we are not all reading from the same book, how can we be on the same page? And one more thing that I will mention on this is one of the core reasons that made me write this book is I was speaking at Harvard University and I asked everybody to raise your hand if you read the diary of Anne Frank. And every single hand went up. And I said, of course, because it's mandated. Now tell me the book of a child slave or even somebody that came from the Jim Crow era. You can't because it does not exist. Growing up, the Holocaust Museum was my favorite museum. They just created the African American Museum. So how can we expect people to have the same level of empathy and sympathy if we are not properly communicating that and educating them on that with all cultures? So definitely with something that happened for 400 years in our country, we should receive the proper education on that. So just like the diary of Anne Frank has done wonders for the world to provide empathy to the Jewish community and understand their journey, our history has been hidden. You yeah. can't find that in a book. You can't yeah. sit down and do that unless you go to History of the Black Dollar. So that's, that's why right. we are very excited to have broken these down into these 10 minute granular education modules to help people receive this information in bite sizes so they can truly get how to make the business case for closing the wealth gap. You gave a lot of information. It's funny that you remember and. Frank, as, as an example, I remember seeing the movie like back yes. in the 1950s something, and I was able to fast forward, tell uh, media conglomerate heads that, look, by watching that film, I had more compassion for a white girl in a country. I didn't know where she was. I'm in segregated exactly. Chicago. It's a poor black girl, you know, who has a faith that wasn't of my faith. She was Jewish. I didn't know her religion, but I was Christian. I didn't see Jesus hanging nowhere. And this fear, and it created such an empathy for me that when my mother left to go to work as a short or a cook, if I heard a fire engine or a police car, it translated to the sound of the Gestapo, whatever the, the German police, right? The Nazis. And I would hide under my bed. I said, so it's the impact of knowing her history to allow me to have empathy for her, not knowing I was in the same situation. And so you mentioned corporations. And I'm happy to say that thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement of last year, Santa Claus has finally come with a few elves and a reindeer to the ghetto. You know, James Brown said because corporations all of a sudden wanted to fund nonprofits. I work with a few major, you know, top corporations who wanted to help and fund certain amounts of money to entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurs. I'll mention one that I'm not working with, like Goldman Sachs. 10 million, 10 billion dollars over 10 years to black women. I'm like, okay, when you divide that, it's not a lot, but it was a start and they're trying to have those conversations. There's been a, a greater increase of diversity and inclusion individuals and corporations, right? But I know that that could be a short window because we live in a state, United States of Baskin and Roberts, who's gonna be the flavor flave of the citizenry. So we have to take advantage of that. So with the programs that you're developing and in partnerships with the historically black colleges and universities, because like you said, how do you know the histories? Well, I think that our historically black colleges and universities should be the Harvards and the Columbia's and the NYU's and the Stanford's and Dartmouth's and Smith are making sure that that information is put out and those other receiving institutions should also be appreciative of what we are trying to do so they can understand where we are and how far we can go with the collective help 
of other cultures and communities appreciating what we have to offer. So, and we're talking about historically black colors. First, let me stop and say one of the wealthiest black men in America, right? We think that because he's worth, you know, several billion dollars that he's in the room where it happens. I'm told that even he is like outside the door trying to make it a little bit of jar. So if a person worth $5.6 billion, but because their black face is not loud, loud into the big room, even though he's making the same pledges as those other people who are probably making that a day, I don't know what you do when you get that wealthy, that he's still ostracized towards blackness. It's like, well, damn, you know, mm -hmm. we don't need that Shawshank Redemption movie that's full, full of getting ourselves forward. We really do need some Mack trucks and we need some heavy hitters and engineers of the vehicles like yourself and other individuals creating these platforms, right? So that that marathon can continue, which was the dream of Nipsey Hussle in California, right? Setting up like we work institutions to educate, having a financial place, I mean, a, a retail space where people can come and buy things created by that particular community, that we now have that and we have to take advantage of it. And what I love about what you're doing and possibly the partnerships with the historically black colleges and university, we can have the possibility of not only bridging the, the disparity at the university level, but making that gown and town and especially black mm -hmm. communities to bridge it because for you to go to a university and not having the tools that normally non-black children have, that financial literacy, or you come from a legacy, or you come just from white privilege, right? You can even get the best, you know, uh, minimum wage job, right? That we need to make sure that our children come into those institutions prepared for a greater work and a faster movement before we're shut out again, based upon whether it's something like COVID, whether it's some other incident where we're cut off financially, that we have something working for us while we educate ourselves. So uh, Angel, what do you think about the collaboration with the historically black colleges and universities since you mentioned it a few moments ago. Yeah, that is one of uh, my life's passions. That's the biggest thing I'm probably most excited to work on this year and excited to do it with you. Um, going across to the HBCUs, I strongly feel as though this should be the book mandated in every University 101 class. Anybody that's went to an HBCU know exactly about that University 101 class. And I think that it would be better served um, with some black history and some financial literacy. Um, we can learn about the university, but let's get some other uh, education in there as well. And since we already have that class um, on every curriculum in every HBCU, why not put a, a history of the black dollar and financial literacy in it? I think it's just a no brainer. Um, from there, we also are proud to have worked with other org, other uh, PWIs, such as Harvard and Wharton, um, uh, University of Chicago, University of Texas, um, Lincoln, um, all type of other uh, PWIs I can name. And I've been proud each time uh, 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 about their efforts. Um, Seattle, Washington is very big on trying to increase their diversity there in the University of Washington. So I look forward to expanding it across the PWIs as well, because as we've discussed throughout this entire um, uh, seminar, that this is not just black history, this is American history. So my mm -hmm. goal is not to just have this as a black history course, but mm -hmm. integrate it into American history because every mm -hmm. single America born needs to understand this information. And like you, it, it's so many parts there. Then additionally, I also feel as though it is critical for corporations. And uh, I think in this day and age of sort of wanting to tackle the sustainable goals and making sure that you are truly investing in diversity and inclusion, the days of checking the box are over and people need to have actionable things. So people, uh, companies like Goldman Sachs have actually been a huge supporter of History of the Black Dollar. Um, going in with the uh, mission that you named, they have purchased copies of the book for about the last four years for many of their HBCU uh, summits and looking forward to hopefully them purchasing it for the entire organization. And so I think that's where we have to start to expand these relationships where uh, you know we get our foot in the door with the diversity, but now 2021, this is a global thing. This is a national thing. It's not just for your employee resource group, it's for all of your employees. 
to be on the same page and not just for your employees, then sponsor it for your local schools. You know, I think that's a big mission for a lot of these corporations to come together and then provide sponsorships to put these books and these gyms in their local universities and schools. That is a easy win-win situation to be able to show that you are truly trying to impact the community. So I think there are um, easier ways to do this than harder. And I look forward to being one of the shepherds and the pioneers uh, working with you, uh, Marcia and Rajiv, as we explore how to be able to put this black history and financial literacy into these digital contexts that meet people where they are. And we can continue to help them uh, expand their education as well as increase their dollars as we are making the business case for closing the wealth gap. That's perfect, because we're talking about not somewhat of a form of reparations when corporations become partners, but we're talking about repairing our own loss. And for, you know, African-Americans, you know, especially for young people, when they think that they cannot help wealth, they talk about the individuals who they admire, who are wealthy. I said, well, if it's an entertainer, if it's an athlete, right, you made them rich because you bought into them by buying tickets to their venues, or if they're in cosmetics or in shapewear, you bought their products, so you made them rich. So what you done for them, how come you cannot think that yourself? You talked about blacks in the music industry. Where would that be if we weren't there? Well, first of all, we revolutionized music in America, whether it was in the country music down here in Nashville, right? When you think of Elvis Presley, well, there was Chuck Berry, right? And when you think about, you know, uh, the Detroit sound, that was compromised in a certain way. And you look at the evolution of hip hop, we, we've made so many people wealthy. And of course, some of the black hip hoppers are definitely giving back, like Jay-Z, who I'm, I'm proud to work with on so social justice uh, mm -hmm. uh, right things, as well as, you know, some other things around entrepreneurship through the cannabis, uh, the parent company. But you think about what, look at Nike grew because of Michael Jordan. Expo mm -hmm. I mean, Michael Jordan's brand alone. And then subsequently all the other ball players having their shoes and their, the starter wear. And that was across the board all the way into the NFL. So between and you would know, Marcia, a little birdie told me you might've helped Jordan uh, with his golf deal or something, something hey, in that room. So, um, well, you know, here's the matter of me, I was, I was trying to take his $23 million. I was in Chicago and Michael Jordan <laughs> came to Chicago and Nike offered him his $23 million deal. And you know, I'm you're like, hey, you know, this is a nice gesture, but that's a Zora Neale Hurst and Pet Negro thing going on here. So I called Michael Llewell and the vice president at the time, who was a black man and said, you know, thank you. I know Michael, he's personal. He's gonna be mad I'm telling you this, but if you gave that $23 million to a high school, you would still have the brand loyalty. Children wouldn't be begging their poor mamas to buy those darn shoes and they wouldn't be killing each other over it. And you had the end result. I mean, you still, you know, Michael Jordan was gonna be okay. See, he's okay. <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, thank yeah. you, Rajiv. I will turn it back over to you. Um, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Marcia, not only for um, your wise words, but also your advocacy um, to ensure that this book does get adopted across Absolutely. the HBCUs, the PWIs, the K-12 schools, as well as the corporations. So we very much look forward to exploring this journey with you. Much success to you, and thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Angel. It was a wonderful discussion. Um, you know, the intent here is to create thriving communities, is it to promote economic inclusivity. And the only way to do that is not by uh, generic diversity and inclusiveness training. It's by really understanding what different communities have had to contend with and what they still contend with to uh, as as impediments to their to their growth and success. So I think this has been enlightening for me, and I know it'll be enlightening for our audience. And it's a perfect uh, 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 perfect discussion to present for Juneteenth as we talk about how do we really celebrate uh, you know this holiday. We celebrate it by creating these kind of inclusive moments in an inclusive society where we can all grow and thrive together by really understanding the experience of one another and really uh, uh, going on that empathetic journey. But more so by understanding the business uh, uh, case for this and being able to help drive and promote it. So thank you for uh, your partnership and uh, we look forward to a wonderful Juneteenth holiday. Thank Happy you. Juneteenth. Thank you. Bye.
bye